at the right time and I was doing another comedy program with Patrick Cargill and in it I was a fortune teller and I had to tell these fortunes and this particular episode at the end of it I said something like and you will meet the man of your life and then wink <laughs> and they took a close up of this week and apparently that very night David Croft was in the audience and he was so impressed with the wink <laughs> that he booked me for one episode to do when Jonesy said, and I say, have you got any sausages? <laughs> and that's all I was booked for. But apparently then it was so, you know, it took off and everything in the wink. And so I owe it all really to David Croft. And there I was, Mrs. Fox. I didn't even have a name in those days. I was just in the, in the queue and the sausage. And then somebody said, <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> and then somebody said, because I wore fox fur, why don't we call her Mrs. Fox? And that's how it all came about. Mm. Wonderful days, not prepared, just right time, right place. Wonderful. I'm just bringing together another guest here, but um, can I just ask you the same question? How did you come to become the town clerk? <laughs> First of all, speaking uh, on behalf of all the bald-headed old duffers here. <laughs> Can anyone tell me what it is they say? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> they never did say it, did they? No, no, I'm still trying to yes, find out. Yes, now there's a quiz. Yeah. What do they say about bald-headed old duffers? You don't need a comb. I'll show <laughs> Come over here and I'll show <laughs> Send it out, send it out. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, it's all down to Jimmy Perry's fault for me being a town clerk in Dad's Army. Uh, in May 1972, I appeared in one episode of a series called The Wallipop, made by then the ATV company up in Elm Street. I played the part of a secretary crow. Uh, in the Grand Old Order of Crows, which many of you have heard of before. And I had to wear a crow outfit, which consisted of a flowing garment, which when I did that looked like wings, mm -hmm. and I had a headdress with a, a beak, which came down in front of my face like that. Mm -hmm. Now, actors generally don't like how their faces covered when they're acting. So it became something of a problem for me, what to do when I actually spoke. And I contrived somehow or other to put my head up in the air like this and speak my lines so that at least most of the audience could see my face. And whatever I did with that particular part, I have been told only today that this was why Jimmy Perry suggested me played a part some six months later in episode 13 of uh, that series of Dad's Army. Thank you very much, Jimmy Perry, wherever you are. Bless you. Right, I think we ought to call another witness into this incident at Warmington UC, and I'd like to ask Private Pike himself, Mr Ian Lavender, to step forward and throw some light on it. Throw some light on what? <laughs> what went on, my dear? 
You promised me you'd never tell them. <laughs> uh, Pike, Pike what was the original question? Pike, Pike didn't look too shocked when he saw Mrs. Mannering. So what? Pike didn't look too shocked when he saw Mrs. Mannering in her... Um, <clears throat> Nobody meetings. saw Mrs. Mannering. No, we never saw Mrs. Mannering. No. Nobody ever saw Mrs. Mannering. No. Yes, now on, on the screen. I wonder what shocked nobody had seen her. <laughs> Knocks out to the door of the shop and says, "Don't knock Mr. Manor in; it's your wife." <laughs> yes, thank you, Pam. It was acting. I don't want to make that. <laughs> <laughs> Why, how did I come in on this conversation? <laughs> Ian, um, that was your first full acting job, major acting job since leaving drama school. It was my first. No, no, it was no, no. Oh, oh. Mike, give him the mic, Mike. Tell him, Ian. I wonder when somebody didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't my first job. Was my, um, I'd, I'd been out of drama school for uh, um, mm -hmm. a year. A year. And uh, I'd been in rep for nine months and I'd made one advert for Woman's Own. <laughs> oh, what? Um, Easter edition, 1960, whatever it was. <laughs> Playing a young husband spreading marmalade on his cornflakes. <laughs> <laughs> because that particular edition of Woman's Own was so marvellous. It, it's, it's quite, a, uh, quite a good piece of business, that. I'm trying to spread. <laughs> uh, trying to spread. My, it's not. It's not easy. And I, I got a phone call from my agent to to call her during that. Uh, was this the question, by the way? Um, uh, to phone her, and, 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 and I thought I got this this job. Um, which was going to be rather nice, it was going to be seven weeks television in the summer, and in this thing called Dad's Army, which I've been to see David Croft about two or three times. And I got the job, and I didn't know what it was going to be. Um, and I'm still not quite sure, looking around, what it is. <laughs> uh, but that, that's how I got, I got the job. I mean, my, my agent sent me up to, uh, to see David. I went three times, I read the script three times. Um, and just before about to go off filming, uh, and my agent said I want to take you out for lunch, which was very nice, and I went out for lunch, so I've got something to tell you, uh, which is that um, David Croft, who is going to be directing Dad's Army, um, is my husband. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that deflated me somewhat. Um, she said, but no, uh, we didn't tell you, because um, David, so that if David didn't want to in it, um, it didn't make any difference. Um, so, so I actually can say that I got the part because my agent was sleeping with the director. <laughs> and it's, it's quite true. Absolutely true. And it was a joy to see both David and Anne again today. Yes. Uh, yes. About the godparents of my sons, etc. What else do you want to um, Well, there's not many of us here, are there, actually? Um, I, I, ha I have a story, um, which is, it's not a story, it's a, a, a narration. Uh, I was lucky enough to um, be working in New Zealand for six months, about seven or eight years ago. And we were in a little town called Napier. <coughs> and the local radio station was just around the corner from the hotel, so wives and friends and so on and other people in the company were sitting there listening to it. And I was doing this interview on the radio with Robin Asquith there. And uh, I don't know whether I can do the accent very well, but uh, about three minutes into the interview, he started. I told, I told us with this would happen because it does happen. It's happened several times. I've won drinks at it. I know what the last line will be. And he said, "Ah, oh, that's a great story. It's a great story. It happened, but ah, uh, nah, no, nah, it never happened." And it started to unfold in front of him as the interviewer said, "Well, of course, there's not many of you left now, are there?" <laughs> I said, "No, no, no, there, there aren't." They said, "Because, uh, I mean, Arthur Lowe's not alive anymore, is he?" He said, "No, no, Arthur died sadly only a couple of years ago." Um, uh, very of course we all do it. And what, what, what about your uncle, John Lemaitre? How do you pronounce that? <laughs> John, John Lemaitre, yes. John Lemaitre, he's gone as well. He? Yes, I'm afraid he has. Conked out, he wrote. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, John sadly died as well. Yes, yeah. And of course, well, I mean, uh, the Spiv, Jimmy Beck, he died early on. Yes, I'm saying yeah. Jimmy did die very early on. It was quite a Quite an achievement actually to get through losing a major character like that. And tell me, is the, is the Scotsman still alive? Uh, no, um, John was not long died. Very sad because he also was godfather to one of my, my sons. 
Well, what about Arthur Ridley? No, Arnold Ridley. Arthur, Arnold, 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 Arnold. Arthur. 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 Yeah, he's, 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 he's still alive. No, um, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Arnold died you know, not too long ago. Um, by this time, Asquith is now sort of going, I can't believe what's happening. Um, and I said, and, and uh, is a. Uh, is the, is the Virgin? I said, Teddy. Is it? No, sir. Teddy died just after the recording of the last episode. Um, glad to hear. Um, ah. What about your mother? Is your mother still with us? <laughs> no, Jan sadly also died not too long ago. Hmm. Will you be making any more? <laughs> Sorry, and so um, at that point, we got back to the hotel. A, I don't think you can top that line, but we got back to the hotel. And everybody said, what was that thud afterwards? What was that noise, that bang? And it was Asquith falling off his seat. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was it like when you, you started working there? There were actors the like of John Laurie, John LeMessurier, to be working amongst people who have been making films for years. <laughs> Um, well, it was, it, it was quite daunting at the start. I mean, I, mean, I um, always asked whether were we like the characters that we played. And I guess it, essentially we were, um, but in one direction or another. Um, I like to think that I was a sort of backward projection. Um, but well, I, I, no, I, I, was, I never saw him as an idiot, you see. I thought he was rather sort of naive and telling the truth at times, and eventually they'd find out that he was right. Um, <laughs> But, uh, I mean, Kareem behind the ears, absolutely. It was, it was the first television series I'd done. I knew we were going to be filming. That didn't mean anything to me quite. I said, I arrived at the television centre and noticed that everybody got suitcases. Um, I had to go home and pack a bag because I thought we were coming home that night. <laughs> and off we went filming. It was, it, it, no, it was, it, was, it was very daunting. I mean, there was Arthur and John, John, John Laurie, who, uh, as far as I was concerned, was one of the greatest Shakespeare actors that I'd ever known and I witnessed the end of his career and Arnold who I knew his history I didn't know Jimmy Beck obviously at that time um, no it, it was terrifying but uh, they were all absolutely lovely and took me under their wing and then along came somebody called Bill Pert or you <laughs> <laughs> tried to blast us out of the water <laughs> oh, 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 oh I thought you were filming I wouldn't have said that otherwise I'm sorry. <laughs> poor soul then you should get up here and say something what 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 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock you were up here and you've not done anything since about the time you came up. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, we got, oh, we got coax him. Come on, Bill. Come on. We want him, don't we? Like a head in my hole. Oh, now this is a stage up here. This is the front. Look. That's called an audience. Oh. Oh, poor soul. You don't realise I'm a very old man now. Oh, yes, we realise you're a very old man. Are you going to play the bus driver, are you? Vroom, 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 vroom. But the, in, 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 in answer to your original question, they, they were lovely and they took me under their wings and pointed me in the wrong direction, Bill pointed me in the wrong direction several times, I found myself in the ladies, but uh, no, they're all absolutely lovely. It's quite unlikely really, isn't it? Eric, James will now have community hymn singing. <laughs> Eric, did the mayor ever recover from having the car re-sprayed? <laughs> I think that was his last episode, wasn't it? He did recover then. No, I don't think he did. No, no. That's a sad thought. But he was a great old man, wasn't he? Yes, wonderful. And I say, before I got into Dad's army, I was watching it as you all were in those early days, never thinking I should ever be in it. 
And when I was finally <laughs> received a call from my agent, the one person I really wanted to see more than anybody else, to see what he was really like off stage, was my friend Ian Lavender. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, how on earth did Mr. Lavender conjure up this marvellous character, Pike? And is he like that off stage? <laughs> and I must say, I was very relieved to find that Ian was a very upstanding, virile young man. Oh. <laughs> well, don't get me wrong. No, no, get him wrong. <laughs> In fact, already his hair was going slightly grey at the temples, and he could have been in an Ethelin Dell novel. Even that early stage, 1972, yes. But the, the show that we've just seen, The Godiva Affair, was my, my favourite episode, so I'm delighted it was shown today. And the highlight of it for me was near the end, when Ian had to come out with this <coughs> lovely word. And uh, I, I can see him now in rehearsal <laughs> Say the first it. time that he actually did it. And yeah, I mean, I, I still laugh when I think about it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great, lovely fellow. And I was so delighted when I found that he was nothing like the character of Pike and what a marvelous interpretation it was of that character from his yeah. <laughs> Well, yes. Uh, I've just been talking to, to Joan the Measure and reminding her of uh, an evening when we were staying at the Bell, and John the Measure said, I don't fancy uh, dinner tonight. Could we have fish and chips? I said, Yes, all right, I'm going to get fish and chips. About uh, half past nine, quarter to ten. So off we go, and uh, we got them, and I said, you're not eating them in the car, stink the place out. He said, no, we'll find somewhere to eat them. And we came across on a very lonely road, a bus shelter. And he said, that's a good place. So then we go to the bus shelter, and we're eating our fish and chips. It's a lovely, warm, moonlit night. Uh, the moon is behind us here, and suddenly a couple of old fellows come, obviously from the pub, they've had a couple, and one said, the other said, how I'm tall, trans are having their supper. <laughs> <laughs> and after they'd gone past, John said, There's no business like <laughs> I think my favourite story, which I'm sure everybody knows by now, when we were doing that Royal Variety performance at the Palladium, and um, it, you know, it was 380 people in that show, various, uh, we had the, uh, uh, the company from Chicago, uh, Kojak, was his name. Tell us about us. He'd come over with his company, the Billy Lyre Company. We were with at the pub, and uh, we had the uh, Kwazulu African dancers and the Ross Mill Voice Choir. They, they, <laughs> they were, in, they were in, in a pub together somewhere. There was the Count Basie Orchestra in the, in the abilities up above Liberties in their restaurant. And we'd done our spot, we came back, and I had to wait there with the finale. It was Arthur Lowe at the top of the hat. In fact, at the beginning of the show, this, we, were in, in, we got into the Palladium because there were only a few dressing rooms there. And uh, he, Arthur disappeared and he, he, he was in a broom cupboard. Somebody found him in a broom cupboard asleep. Uh, and they said, Arthur, the Queen's arrived. He's a marvelous. burped a few times and uh, came out. And as I said, we've done our spot. And then we go back and we're waiting now for the finale. So we're then taken with all the other people back into the Palladium. Uh, snakes of you know actors and actresses going in and I eventually found myself next to Arthur on the side of the stage the finale is on with Vera Lynn and uh, Harry Seacombe the Ross Mill voice choir singing Down of Open Glory looking up to sing the, the um, Queen and Duke Bedden with the Royal Box and uh, there's a noise on the right hand side of me and uh, I started to look around and so did Arthur and there was one of the quasi African dancers feeding her baby at her breast. The little lad had been there all day, he was probably hungry. And uh, nothing 
wrong in that at all, but turned around, but Arthur's hand started to go, and I knew he was going to say something. <laughs> and sure enough, he turned around, he said, he likes to drink, does he? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough, no, the hand's still going. And in that immaculate time, he turned around, he said, I could do with one right now. I could. <laughs> She did give him a funny look there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, anyway, there was a message from Vera Lee to say that she's very sorry. She couldn't get here today, but her husband's not been well. But a nice message from her. And also from Bill Cotton, who's not been well. But he's, uh, he's, a, he's in the most... No, no. He's, uh, he's all right. He's progressing OK. Well, there we are. Uh, that's enough for me, I'm sure. Wonderful. Can I just say, my darlings, I would like to thank you on behalf of what's left of us, for coming today. I think it has been absolutely splendid. It's the first one I've attended because I couldn't come to York because um, I was working at the time, but you are all so lovely and please do not stop loving us because we need you. We really do. You've made Dad's Army. It's you that's made Dad's Army in this wonderful, wonderful sort of institution. And I'm very proud and I know all of us are. But I would like to say one small thing, that my favourite episode, of course, was when I got married. Ah, oh, well, it was wonderful. And Clive and I always had a lot of fun together, but when we were rehearsing, I don't know if you remember, but after the rehearsal, Arthur and I, I think it was cutting the cake, we go out through the door together. And as we were going out, we just wanted to get off the, the, the set, and we banged into each other and got stuck, you see. So I said, well, I'm sorry, Arthur. Darling, he said, no, no, no. He said, keep it in, dear. He said, don't tell the others till the night. Don't let David know. So when it came to the actual transmission, when we got stuck in the door, it wasn't pretend we'd rehearsed before, but we left it as a big surprise to, the, to David up in the box. It was wonderful. But is Clive here? Because I would like him to come up, because I haven't seen my husband for some time now. <laughs> Will you go and interrupt him and say that Mrs. Jones does wish him to be here? <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Okay, while we're waiting, while we're waiting for Clive, are there any questions for anyone in the audience they'd like to ask at this point? Yes, we want to hear about the Oh, yes, yes. How did Ian make his hair go black? Did he take <laughs> My mother and father had to do that. <laughs> uh, at the time, I wasn't, no, I uh, wasn't totally uh, white. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> um, for the television series. Black. Well, yes. Yeah. It was like that. You were younger then. Yeah, you were. Um, no, towards the end it was it was it was going um, it was going white, um, and oh, for, for just the one off on the on the uh, on the television, uh, Brill cream and, and water would make it look black and shine. But um, I did have to dye it for the stage show. Um, during which, so I had my hair dyed dark for what fifteen months, and let it grow out, grow out, grow out, grow out. <laughs> it grew out. New English language. And um, so uh, after that, it, 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 it grew out. And so about six months after that, there I was with white hair. It all happened without me knowing, quite honestly. <laughs> uh, I'd, gone, I'd gone totally white during the stage show of it. Other things happened during that as well. <laughs> and we weren't going to that. Um, no, it's just brew cream. Works wonders. And I, I still have a stock of it. If anybody wants to buy some real cream, I've got uh, a boot full of it. Um, it was, uh, sorry, nothing terribly interesting. It was really a rather boring way of making your hair go black. Um, what was it like to be a German officer? Well, I always say that that was my favourite episode because um, it, it was the... Um, John, John and I, of course, during filming for a week, um, were dressed as, uh, as officers, everybody else was still dressed as, uh, as privates in the German Army. And uh, then in the studio, of course, that one day we had the officer uniform. So for, it was a favourite episode, not because it was necessarily terribly funny, but because we had a comfortable costume for that, for that time. Um, 
No, it was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Philip, Philip, Philip who? Madam. Uh, it's, 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 wasn't that episode? Don't tell him. It's a different episode. No, it's a different episode. Oh, poor old soul. Oh, dear. Yeah. This is the Heidi High Convention, you do realise that, don't you? Uh, no! Oh, for heaven's sake! It was lovely because it was a comfortable costume, whoever. Yes, it was great, terrific. I slapped me thigh and asked for 33 bit of beers. Miles of London, then. What? Clive, Clive is halfway through the thing. Clive is halfway through the thing. The umpire's been up and said the light is getting in his way, so they've had to stop him reaching the camera. So he's done half of it, and now he's going to come up and see his bit. They've had to stop filming because it interfered with the play. Right. Clive, stop play. There he is. There. to the audience to pass over to somebody who might talk sense. Didn't notice a pass over. <laughs> <laughs> right. oh, how are you? Sorry. Sorry. I'm going to do some Morris dancing. Sorry. You fell off the body. Unfortunately, Morris isn't feeling very well, so... <laughs> um, then, yeah, I want you to sing a little song with me now. I'm right in the middle of doing broadcast, by the way, down in another room. And they said, and the umpire came up and said, what the bleeding hell's going on? I've got the light shining in the diary's eye. <laughs> <laughs> this is true, you wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> so we're right, don't, don't know, you've got to sing this song with me, okay? Don't do that, that, that. Who do you think you are feeling, Mr. Hitler? If you think we're wrong, the wrong. We are the boys who will stop your little game. We are the boys who will make you think again. So who do you think you are giving Mr. Hitler when you say old England son? Mr. Brown goes off to town on the A21. He comes home, he's evening and he's ready with his gun. So who do you think you are giving Mr. Hitler I don't know anymore, but I tell you what, it's not, it's not all bad news when you get really old. An old friend of mine, 92, got married to his friend. She was 87, he was 92, and they got married. Isn't that lovely? Oh. Yeah. Spent their honeymoon getting into the taxi. But this, this old mate of mine was 87, it's his birthday. He thought himself, give himself a bit of a treat, you see. So he went down the bed and he went into the, um, into the draper's shop and he says, uh, could I have one of those new duvets, please? She said, duck down, he said, can I have one of those new <laughs> <laughs> they went to Sainsbury, went to Sainsbury's and he says, um, could I have some bacon please? She said, lean back so it's on. <laughs> <laughs> Not fanny fanny, that is it? <laughs> could you tell me what methods of contraception you should use? Well, I go, sure. Well, anyway, so she got some funny answers. She ends up in a village near Grimsby. Knocked on a fisherman's cottage and she said, Excuse me, she said, uh, I'm from the Family Planning Association. Would you mind telling me what method of contraception you use? She said, Pardon? She said, What method would you use? The moon method, the lunar? Or the museum? And she said, Oh, we don't bother with none of that. She said, My husband's a fisherman. And she said, Yeah, but what do you mean? She said, Well, he's much shorter than I am. She said, well, what, what do you use? She said, we use a herring box. <laughs> she said, I stand him on the herring box, and when his eyes go for me, I kick the box away. <laughs> 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 